Uh, but now we're back. I think I'm gonna go to bed. We're going to Lhasa tomorrow. Finally. So far I've had a really excellent experience. I'm a little uh, weirded out just because I haven't gotten homesick at all yet. And it's very um, strange to be in a place in my life where you don't miss home. I don't really have a home that feels that way. So um, it's definitely an interesting experience to be far away and having a better experience and not missing really anyone or anything um, back where you came from. Today we traveled from Satong back to Lhasa and we traveled on the most gloriously paved road that I had ever seen after all those bumpy roads. Um, it was the first time I actually was able to sleep on the bus and um, also to actually enjoy some of the scenery because my head wasn't hitting the ceiling. Once we got to Lhasa, we went to a country village um, to visit a Tibetan in his own household. Then we were inside and we met the man who owned the house, Kelsan Punso, and he invited us in, sat us down, served us some hot water, which I'm hoping was boiled at some point. and offered us candy, which is really nice. This is chocolate, that's international language for me. We just sort of sat and chatted through an interpreter and he showed us around the house and uh, one room was entirely devoted to a Buddhist altar. So it was almost like he had his own little monastery inside the house. Um, we talked to him a little bit and found out that he um, is not only Buddhist but also has posters of Mao on his wall and um, it was interesting to hear both how religious he is and how much he favors the recent changes here in Tibet. After doing the country visit, we came back into Lhasa and we did sort of a city version of the visit. We went to what was kind of an, an apartment complex in the Tibetan quarter and met a man named Ishi and he's 69 years old and he invited us into his apartment and it was a great deal smaller than, uh, than the country house. His apartment probably could have fit in the, the main sitting room at the other house. But it was still it was a nice cozy apartment and he also had one room entirely dedicated to a Buddhist shrine and he also had Mao on the wall and he was also very complimentary about the the current government and how they've raised standard of living and uh, changed Tibet for the better and it was actually a really interesting experience because it got me thinking a lot and you know first knee-jerk reaction is oh he's a shill for the government uh, we were because it was actually a, a sort of a government arranged visit. So first reaction is, oh, he's just spouting the Communist Party line, and they told him to say that. But then the more we think about it, Tibet probably was extremely rough place to live before the uh, communist takeover, and standard of living probably has gotten a, a whole lot better. Uh, he's got himself a nice apartment. Lord knows where he was living back when he was a young kid or when he was 15, 20. So the more I learn, the more confused I get the whole, about the whole situation, which I think is actually a very good thing. Because before coming here, all I really knew about Tibet was the American media policy. And uh, my first knee-jerk reaction is, oh, the communists told him to say that. And the more I think about it, all I know about Tibet is what America has told me to think about it. So it's good to come here and get all kinds of different views. And while it's not clearing anything up for me, it's at least making me think more and make me realize that everything I know, I don't know. It's easy to imagine that life here is a lot better. Um, just the living conditions and, and dealing with the weather and some of the access to consumer goods that they might have, but it's also hard to know um, if these people were being honest or not. And uh, I'll always wonder if that's my perspective on things or, or if that's a, a realistic view of things to, um, 
consider while you're here in Tibet. Um, one refrain I've been saying over and over and over again is the longer I'm here, the less I know about the situation. Um, it's just very complex and I'm very grateful to have the opportunity to escape some of the American media and uh, look into it a little bit further by meeting Tibetan people. Um, I just hope to do a little bit more digging and see if I can reach any conclusions. I'm not really sure that I will. Today we got back to Lhasa and we went on some home visits, but I think I honestly answer, uh, expressed my feelings about the whole thing about as well as I possibly could down in the courtyard, and I don't think I really have anything to add to that. And I think from a political standpoint that saving Tibet isn't possible. I think that um, it's probably just a province in China um, for a long time to come. But I think that you can also view Tibetan culture and the Tibetan lifestyle and those things about themselves and their identity that they want to maintain. I'm hopeful that they'll find a way to keep those things alive while falling into the, the um, Chinese mainstream and improving their lifestyles. In a lot of ways, I feel like today has been the culmination of the trip, like everything has been building up to this, even though the trip isn't over yet. But today we went to the Potala in the morning, and that's what I've been looking forward to for years now. It was pretty amazing. We drove up sort of the back entrance of it and started kind of from the top and maybe worked our way down. Uh, we got to go into the holiest shrine in the entire Potala. That was a very interesting room because most of the Patala actually was built later for the fifth Dalai Lama in the 17th century. So it was nice to see the original structure and then kind of go around and see some of the rest that was built. There was a monk in there kind of showing us around, pointing out a few things. It was really nice to get a little bit of a extra explanation. And then when we came out, actually one of the security guards started showing us around the whole place. And he'd been working there for 20 years, so he knew an awful lot about the place and his English was great. Really helped us out. He pointed out a lot of things that I don't think I would have understood. Uh, especially with some of the paintings, he pointed out what, what the meaning was, what the story was behind it. There were even a few uh, white people painted on the walls there early English, French, German people who had uh, come to Tibet. Uh, one interesting thing about the Potala was it seems like every Dalai Lama had his own throne room. I would have expected one throne room that they kept using over and over, but the guard was pointing out this is the sixth Dalai Lama's throne room, this is the seventh, the eighth Dalai Lama's throne room. Uh, sun's out. We hung out on the roof of the Potala. Just being on top of the Potala was sort of the culmination of many years of looking forward to this and it was really awesome being up there, it was amazing. Potala is actually structured with a white palace and a red palace and um, the red palace is kind of more of the religious side of the building, the white palace is more of the political side of the building. One of the cooler parts of the white palace was seeing where the 13th and 14th Dalai Lamas used to live and pray. Um, I couldn't even imagine some of the changes that they saw outside the windows while they were there. Um, so it was really amazing to see some of their private rooms and chambers and some of their clothing and articles that were left behind um, when the 14th Dalai Lama left.
Even just exiting the Potala was an experience in and of itself. There's a giant ramp of stairs that snakes its way down the front side. Uh, we walked down, a, a, I guess, a slanted set of stairs that kept going and going and going and going. And uh, as I was work, working my way down the stairs, I kept looking up back at it, and it just seemed to grow every time I looked back up. The building's just immense. And every time I look at it, it just gets better. I've been staring at it from the top of the Joe Khan right here. And the more I look at it, the better it gets. I just uh, get more attached. The structure of the Patala itself is absolutely overwhelming. You can stand next to it and have a sore neck from trying to look up and up and up. And I tried to get some pictures that convey the magnitude of the building, and I'm pretty sure they failed. Another part that was interesting was at the bottom of the Patala, there were slave quarters, and I had no idea that um, there had been slaves. And it was kind of a really self-contained world of the Patala with slaves and different things going on near the base. So I thought it was a really good history lesson while I was there as well. Jokan Temple is the holiest of holy structures in all of Tibet. This is the big one. This is where everybody wants to come, and it's, uh, it's pretty amazing. Just when you think you can't go into another room and look at another thousand statues, you walk in here and it's amazing all over again. The Jokong Temple was built in the 7th century for Songsen Gampo. He apparently wanted a place to put his Nepali wife's dowry, um, but it was his Chinese wife that selected the location and it's apparently on the heart of the demoness um, that was thought to be covering Tibet. And that is um, the opposite or actually in complement to Trandruk Monastery, which I believe is covering her left so shoulder. So I thought it was kind of an interesting continuity of the theme of covering the demoness. The inside was beautiful. The, uh, it's just so old. The place is about 1,300 years old. And while a lot of it's been rebuilt again and again and again over the years, some of the wood structures in here date back from the 700s you feel it as you're walking around here. It's still an active temple here. There are lots of monks. And we got to sit through a prayer and chanting session. They had a lot of intricate hand movements, which I hadn't noticed before. They had bells. Some of them were playing drums. And it was the first time that I'd actually seen the scriptures in use. And at a lot of the temples we've been at, we've gotten to see the scriptures on the walls. But in this particular chanting ceremony, the monks had uh, narrow strips of paper with Tibetan script and were flipping through them to keep on cue and go through the ceremony that way. And I had a strange connection while I was there in which one of the monks was making faces at me and going like this. And I thought it was really funny and it made me laugh. And to think that a monk in the middle of his meditation is trying to get me to smile means I probably have a little work to do on, on cheering up, but it was a really wonderful connection. I enjoyed um, the, the chanting ceremony and kind of felt falling, myself falling into a trance state while I was there. We also got to join in on one of the koras. The kora is sort of a circular pilgrim walk. And this is a small kora. It just goes around the main shrine of the temple but it was bustling with people and pilgrims just rushing right along. They go at a surprisingly good clip for a holy walk. They're just pushing right along and they don't mind shoving you out of the way if you're going too slow. I also walked past, uh, started doing some of the prayer wheels, got kind of caught in a corral of prayer, reel, prayer wheels, didn't realize that they just go on and on and on and on and on and on. My arm's hurting. <laughs> it's a lot of work. You gotta really mean it to go through the entire thing. But uh, I guess I got some good karma out of it, so it was definitely worth it.
Today was a really great day. We started off, we went right to the Potala, finally. So excited to get there. Been looking forward to seeing it for so long and it just, it did not disappoint. It was a, uh, it was an amazing sight from a distance and then when we got right up on it, it was just that much more interesting and just having it towering, us, towering over us. Even later on in the day, we were somewhere where we could look at it from a distance and I was just found myself staring at it for a while. It's just an amazing building. Okay, I'm in the dark core square where I was just sitting down because I was tired and an old woman came and sat next to me and she just said Tashi Delay and I said that back and we really couldn't talk because of language differences but um, we just kind of sat together and watched the people and giggled um, at certain things as they went by so um, that was kind of a, a meaningful exchange that I had that it didn't involve um, translation or words and it, it still um, felt really good to me. Um, today we went to the Norbalinka Palace, which was the summer palace uh, and built in 1755 for the seventh Dalai Lama. Um, starting with the seventh Dalai Lama, they started using it as a summer palace and going there. Um, during the summer months and using the Potala only during the winter months. And I was just so confused about why they would um, move their entire government about two miles down the street um, for winter and summer, but apparently the Potala doesn't have good ventilation and gets a little bit too warm. Um, so Norbalinka was really spread out. There were lots of trees. It kind of felt like a really serene college campus while we were there. First we went to the room of the seventh Dalai Lama and it was kind of interesting. It almost looked to me like the whole place was in the process of fading away. The, uh, the colors were really muted and kind of faded and the whole place just looked like it was almost disappearing before your eyes. It was kind of interesting. And after the seventh Dalai Lama's palace, we went to the 13th and 14th Dalai Lama's palace. And that one particularly looked like it had just been abandoned, which actually I guess it had been when the Dalai Lama left. That was actually the palace that he escaped from dressed as a uh, Tibetan guard. Both palaces were set on the, were set in a really nice area. There was a whole large grounds that you could wander around for a while. There was a man-made lake and there was a lot of woods. This afternoon we went into Barcourt Square to do a little bit of shopping and I am definitely green. I've lost, I think, uh, most of my bargaining powers and haven't had enough time to get back into the swing of things. Uh, the first woman that I stopped at her stall, she was very aggressive and kept trying to sell me something that I just could never afford. I mean, it was just way too much and I don't have the budget for it. Yeah. Uh, I eventually ended up buying a human skull with inla inlaid silver. The skull, as weird as it may sound to us uh, from the reading that I've done in Tibetan culture, when somebody dies, their soul leaves and the body is just a vessel and it's not a big deal. So to have uh, somebody's skull, for example, when, some when your best friend dies, usually take their part of their skull and it's a memory thing something to remember them by and they'll make bowls out of them and everyday household objects out of bone and skulls of people so that they can remember them by and uh, they don't get as freaked out by having body parts around as we in the west do today we went to the market in the barcourt square and um, it was my first time shopping here in lhasa and it wasn't as scary or overwhelming as i thought it might be um, I bargained down to about, I guess, a third of what they had asked for my little tchotchke, um, which has a monkey on it, and I really like monkeys, and so I was happy to get that. We did find a Tibetan woman who was selling, uh, had a little stall there, and we got a chance to talk to her through an interpreter, and that was actually really nice. She's been there for about five years selling the stuff. She works every single day, Apparently doesn't take any vacations. Uh, she buys her goods from mostly from Tibet. 
she had a lot of interesting wide variety of things and uh, I think packing that stuff up at every night and unpacking it every morning that's got to be a huge chore in and of itself. I think I got a lot of what I hope to get out of this experience. Um, I think first and foremost I wanted to experience a third world country. I'm not sure if this counts as third world anymore. It seems to be fairly modernized. Um, but I wanted to experience a different culture, meet new people and see different sights and sounds and Tibet delivered that in an overwhelmingly <laughs> positive way. Um, the scenery was beautiful, the people were wonderful and I really had a nice time just seeing different sights and um, I felt that I got to see some of the religious aspects, some of the cultural aspects, um, and just really get to see different parts of life here, political and religious, and just day to day. My biggest perception that has changed from having spent time here in Tibet, and I'm really surprised about this, is I'm no longer sure that Tibet really needs to be an independent nation. Before I came, free Tibet seemed like such an obvious and cut and dry statement. It, I mean, I was like, of course, free Tibet. Why wouldn't you want them to be free Tibet? And now having been here and having talked to some Tibetans about the whole situation, I'm not at all sure that Tibet needs to be an independent state. And I'm not the least bit convinced that most Tibetans are, even want that. I'm hoping that my experience here will allow me to um, talk to people, especially those people that maybe have a simplified view of the Free Tibet campaign, and maybe convey not a straight answer, but just get them to think a little bit more about how maybe the only source of information they have is the American media, and that there might be other viewpoints to be had. Um, I would really like to share some of the information I've learned here. Because of uh, language differences, I didn't really get a chance to find out too much what Tibetans think of America or Americans. But I can say that there were a number of times when people asked me where I was from and I would say America. And it was always greeted with a smile and, oh, America, America, America. It was, it was always a happy response, which I was glad to hear. I was, and, uh, I was a little nervous the first few times I said I'm an American. A lot of times overseas when you say that you get scorn and bad looks, but here everybody seemed pretty happy to say hello and glad I came so far to see their country. The more I talked to people here, um, the more I found out that they're actually really grateful to the Chinese for some of the new um, improvements and opportunities that they have. Uh, certainly in education and in consumer goods, they have a lot more choices. Um, with education, they're learning Tibetan, Chinese, and English, um, and I think that's helping them to get by in the world and make an influence here. Um, I was impressed that they're actually still learning Tibetan as well as the other two languages, and it seems that they're trying to retain their culture and identity while also embracing the change and modernity and having better lives. I think the most important advice I could give to anybody who wants to come to Tibet is to come with an open mind and try to let go of all your, your notions that you have about Tibet. Uh, I know personally I had a lot of notions that were sort of force fed to me and I'm now realizing more than ever that American media and um, just the American point of view is really, really one-sided and it was very hard at first to not have knee-jerk reactions to everything anybody said and it took a while to let go of that but after a while I finally managed to. It's been two weeks and I'm starting to get over my knee-jerk reactions to what communism is all about and what free Tibet is all about and starting to actually listen and look and really see what's going on and I think that's uh,
sales and promotions for video games. I'm John Mogio. Uh, everybody calls me Moj. I'm a graphic designer from San Francisco. This, this is Tibet, Tibet Diary. Diary. This is Tibet Diary. This is Tibet Diary. I have never been to Tibet, um, and the reason I want to go is um, in part just because I've been working in America um, from 9 to 6 on weekdays for the last six years, and I've just felt a little bit claustrophobic. I just um, got my first mortgage, and it was the most overwhelming sort of claustrophobic feeling I had ever had. So there's a little bit of just natural wonderlist, and then Tibet seemed like about as far as I could possibly go. I've never been to Tibet. I've seen a handful of pictures and uh, I've heard tale of it. It's got sort of a mystique, I guess, that uh, that's very attractive. Uh -huh. I'm going to try and get all this into this. <laughs> it's so not going to happen. I have a lot of trouble envisioning what the trip is going to be. Uh, I don't really know enough about where I'm going and what I'm going to see to really get an idea. I can't picture it in my head. I can't imagine it. Uh, I've seen a handful of photos and uh, I've heard tales. <laughs> I've got a friend who's been to Tibet a couple of times and whenever he talks about it he gets this just sort of dreamy, far away, happy look in his face. So uh, just based on that I'm pretty sure I'm, gonna, I'm in for a really special experience. Take one tablet by mouth twice daily. Begin 24 hours before high altitude travel. Continue until 24 hours after max altitude reached. I haven't had a lot of special advice about going over there because not a lot of people have been. And um, one of the telling things is where I work, I can reach 2,000 people with an email. And I sent an email out asking for advice about what to pack or what to see and do. And I didn't get a single response about someone that had been to Tibet. And then the pile of stuff that's somehow going to go into a bag is over there on the floor. And for the past week or so, I've just been digging out travel stuff that I already owned and buying some stuff and throwing it on the floor there. So somehow that's all going to have to go into a small bag. A lot of what I know about Tibet is based on the sort of free Tibet campaign and then movies. And I don't know how realistic those are in portraying the day-to-day -day life of Tibetans. This is a sleep sack, and it's... Um, a lightweight sleep thing to help keep like bed bugs and mice at bay even though it doesn't really work. Um, I just like it because it's comfortable and I'm going to bring it but I don't know if I'll actually use it. What little I know about the Tibetan political situation is that they are, it's a mess. <laughs> uh, I know they've, uh, they're claimed by China and it's the claim on China is sort of based on ancient history and uh, it's kind of a tenuous claim although it's you know they they went in there they took it <coughs> a book on Tibet to read for fun bungee cords because you hate you never know China's official position is to protect the Tibetan culture but this sort of unofficial position seems to be to assimilate the culture and kind of meld it into the Chinese culture and water it down, if not make it completely disappear. So I'm very curious, I guess worried really about what's going to happen in the long run. Is Tibet, just, is Tibet really going to continue to exist or is it just going to become an artifact? I don't need any of that. I can't wait to go. I want to go now. I don't know a whole lot about the political situation in Tibet. Um, other than that, they would like to be an autonomous region and regain their independence. I know that um, there has been a lot of struggle there, a lot of genocide, and a lot of things we probably haven't heard over here in the West. And um, I, I just don't know if that's something that they would ever be able to achieve. And um, I'm not sure how my going to Tibet affects the political 
side of things there. I worry that it might be supporting the Chinese government and making Tibet into more of a Disneyland tourist region. I, I just, I have concerns about going, but I also have heard that it's good to go and see the Tibetan culture as it exists today and, and learn about it and bring it back home with you. I think the best part of the trip is going to be the trip. Um, I'm going to Tibet, you know, what, what's not going to be great about it? We're in Tibet. This is, I think, one of the most spectacular airports I've ever seen. Just nestled right in the middle of these, just tucked into these hills. And I can already tell I'm going to have trouble breathing. <laughs> I'm getting out of breath just saying this. Maybe it's just the excitement, I don't know. I'm pretty sure it's the 12,000 feet. I can't tell if I'm dizzy with excitement or lack of oxygen, but this is the most astounding scenery I've ever seen at an airport, and it is by far exceeding my expectations. So I'm glad we're in Tibet finally, and I can't wait to get acclimated and start hiking around and seeing more of it. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>